What makes the new crop of direct-to-consumer digital brands so successful so quickly? I'm Alex Parkinson, co-leader of the Communications Institute at the Conference Board and principal of Parkey Communications, and today I'll be joined by the CEO and co-founder of Red Antler to discuss how to build brand love for your organization. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us today for this Marketing Communications uh, Watch webcast. Uh, before I introduce our guest speaker, just very quickly, uh, CPE credits are available for today's broadcast. Uh, in order to get those credits, you need to watch the program in its entirety, click on the three pop-up boxes that you'll see uh, throughout the duration of the program, and then uh, provide your name and email address in the box uh, at the bottom of my video screen here. You should see that pretty clearly where it says request CPE credits here. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our guest today, JB Osborne. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of Red Antler, which is responsible for some of the most recognizable young uh, direct-to-consumer brands around, including All Allbirds, uh, Casper, and Brandless. JB's experience sits at the intersection of creative services and venture capital and advising operating teams and investors on brands as a competitive advantage. JB, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. Cool. So uh, JB and I are really just going to have a chat today. Um, I encourage you all out there to ask questions as they occur to you throughout, throughout the program. We'll fo fold them into our conversation. There is a chat pod in the bottom left of your screen. Just type them into there and we'll pick those up and, uh, and, and field those questions. But to get started, uh, JB, let's keep it nice and easy in the beginning. I'd love to hear a little bit about your story, um, how you came to, to Red Antler to found the organization, uh, and a little bit about your background. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first off, thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Uh, and don't be shy with the questions. I hope we get a bunch. Um, so my background, I started my career at Saatchi & Saatchi in New York. Uh, in traditional advertising, working with um, mostly big CPG brands, Procter & Gamble, General Mills. Uh, got a really incredible education in insight-driven brand building. And through a series of twists and turns, I wound up uh, with a really exciting opportunity to open up the New York office of an agency that was based in New Zealand. And uh, jumped into that after about three years of Saatchi. And while I was getting that business off the ground, uh, and, and hired my now co-founder Emily to come and join me, who I knew from Saatchi, we started meeting entrepreneurs. And I think um, what we saw was just really incredible potential to work with people who had a vision, passion, wanted to put something newer, better, and out in the world and solve a real problem that they saw. And compared to what we were doing when we were working in advertising, which really felt like trying to find ways to say new things about things that didn't have new things to say, uh, which is often a challenge, we were posed with the opportunity to figure out how to bring new things to market in a way that would connect with consumers and really work from a, a blank slate. And that seemed both incredibly exciting and incredibly scary, and I think that's why we jumped into it. So Red Antler started as what felt like really the obvious next step and uh, in starting the business, it was Emily and I, and we had one client, which is a company called Behance. They uh, were building a platform for creative professionals, like LinkedIn meets a portfolio site, and we were incredibly lucky to be a part of their team, work out of their office, and see the inside of building a new business from the ground up. And that was an incredible education coming from being in the agency world to actually being within a startup as we were starting our consultancy. 
And so we worked with Behance uh, and then started working with businesses across a number of categories, uh, an energy drink called eBoost. This is back in 2007. Um, we worked with One Kings Lane, which was uh, the first kind of large-scale commerce business we worked with. Um, Tasting Table was the daily newsletter and the media space, and really just kind of honed our approach to helping founders figure out how to position their, their business, their product, their service, to tell a story, to create an experience. And I think from the beginning, something that was inherent to how we operated was thinking about, it was really, it was all just based on problem solving of someone has a new idea, we need to figure out how to communicate it to people, get them to understand it and have them want to be a part of it. And brand was inherently at the core of that and thinking strategically about how to position that business, how to tell the story in a way that would be emotionally resonant and then how to manifest that across the customer experience. So, you know, looking back, there wasn't such a clear calculation of exactly what we were going to be doing in terms of the services and capabilities. But all of that naturally fell together based on the objective that we were posed with, which was, you know, take this thing as an I that is an idea and help to launch it to the world in a way that it becomes a successful business. So what we built out was uh, a business that focused on brand positioning, uh, you know, consumer insights that leads to brand positioning, and then we're doing naming work, messaging and tone of voice, designing identity systems, uh, digital experiences, e-com, marketing sites, applications, industrial design, packaging design, uh, advertising, creative production, and then most recently in the last year, performance marketing and media. And um, we, we often get the question of like, you know, how have your services evolved over time? And the interesting piece of that is aside from media, we were doing versions of all of those things from day one. Uh, we just built out much more robust capabilities, uh, more breadth and depth within each of those, and now have a team of about 120 based in Brooklyn and clients all over the country. Um, done some international stuff and obviously some brands that are not international, but most of our clients are based across the US and, and Canada. Um, and we focus on working with companies at uh, kind of, I'd say, two different moments in time. So one is working with teams that are incredibly early and helping them go to market. And quite often that's one, two, three, four people, in many cases pre-capital, and we're getting involved as really an extension of their team to help figure out how to bring that to life uh, sometimes introducing them to investors and in many cases taking equity in those businesses as a, you know, a true partner and then helping them to launch the business. And in other cases we're getting involved with a business that's already in market and the challenge is more one of what does the next phase of growth look like? Um, how do we better tell our story? How do we make sure that how we show up as a brand is at the same caliber as the actual product or service we deliver? Uh, they might be looking to um, spend more money on paid media, marketing, advertising. Um, and, and I think you know, on this slide we've got a range of different companies that we've worked with and I think very intentionally we've been category agnostic. We've done a ton of stuff that is consumer versus B2B and enterprise just based on where there's passion behind building brands. Um, but across all different categories, food, beverage, consumer products, uh, fashion, beauty, um, We've done fintech, healthcare, all sorts of, you name it, real estate. We've done a little bit of everything, and it's been very intentional because my philosophy, especially coming from an agency that was very focused in terms of category experience, I always thought that the more that we were stretched to learn about new categories, we'd be able to bring a fresh perspective, and we could also learn from one category and apply to another. And that approach has, I think, really helped us um, solve the true problems and see the opportunity versus kind of taking a formula and copy and pasting it from one opportunity to the next. Cool. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that overview. We've got a few slides of, uh, of some of your work here that we'll just scroll through as, as you and I are chatting. Um, but uh, let's, let's get into the heart of the conversation here. Uh, so a lot, a lot of the companies are recognizable brands as, uh, as startups noted for their different approach to, to brand building. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about what's what's different about your approach to these new startup brands from the traditional branding model? Uh, you know, how how do you get out there and gain awareness for for these new brands? Yeah, I think what's really critical is, I mean, there's a couple pieces. Um, one is the approach that we're taking has to be incredibly focused and strategic because we're in a situation where you've got one shot, limited resources, and therefore. Everything has to be focused on, how, you know, taking your best crack at putting something out into the world that's going to work. 
And when you've got limited resources, I think that forces focusing on the details that are going to matter um, in a way that can be incredibly productive. So the way that we approach it is, one, being incredibly strategically driven. And this is something that we really um, you know, give credit to the experience we had working with brands that really understood their consumer and believed in insights and positioning. That's something that we take incredibly seriously and is where we start every single project. Um, and an example like Casper, this business is one where we were involved um, pre-funding, you know, they were, they really had an idea, they were figuring out how to produce the product, and our work with them started with, okay, how do we bring a new mattress to market that's going to be sold online only, and tell a story that consumers will believe that this is a better way, and you can get a better product at a better price with a better experience, um, but it couldn't just be about a mattress. And we had to tell a bigger emotional story that would kind of engage people and, and reset how they think about that category and, and think of it as an opportunity to like really build love. And I think if you rewind back to pre-Casper, uh, I don't think people would have ever talked about their mattress as something that they cared deeply about. Maybe they felt like it did a good job and they slept well, but I don't think they cared about the brand in any way. And what we saw as an exciting opportunity is how do you kind of take that and flip it on its head? And all of that started with an initial insight of, you know, how do we differentiate from the category conversation where everyone's wrapped up in features, functionality, technology, and they're trying to kind of outdo each other with the newfangled things that they're putting into their mattresses, and kind of confusing customers where there's so many options that the whole game is an upsell, and you ultimately walk away from buying one and feeling like, did I really get the right thing, and did someone just rip me off, and that pretty terrible experience and flip that into something where we say, you know what, like the reason you care about getting a new mattress and the reason why you should want a Casper is that if you have a great night's sleep, you can enjoy your life more. You know, you can go and kind of be who you want to do, be who you want to be, do what you want to do and think of it more as a lifestyle brand and a brand that empowers living your best life versus a brand that can only live in your sleeping hours. And so that strategy is a thing that, um, that kind of like unlocks where the opportunity lies and then it becomes, uh, from that focus, how do you bring it to life in a way that is nuanced and thoughtful and incredibly holistic? So uh, most of these projects, we're working across the identity system, developing messaging, tone of voice, all the key kind of messaging points around um, benefits, reasons to believe, and then we're bringing that to life across a digital experience. So wireframing a site, writing all the copy, art directing all the content, uh, in a lot of cases, building it as well, thinking about the packaging experience and all those little moments of like unboxing the product um, and seeing them as, as kind of at each step, how do you build a deeper relationship instead of a, a transaction? And I think a lot of more traditional businesses, especially when it comes to e-commerce, think about the objective being selling a product. And then once that happens, it's like, all right, throw the cash in the register, like we're good to go. The rea what these new businesses are doing is seeing that as the beginning of a relationship. And when that product shows up, that's the chance to make someone love you even more. And um, so it's, it's the digital experience, it's the physical experience, it's the content and communications, and then continuing to flow that through how the brand shows up through marketing, through advertising. And I think that that holistic approach um, at the very early stages was something that wasn't really happening when we started working with startups. We were kind of taking what was like a big brand playbook of what you would obviously do if you had the resources and the money and, and scale and trying to figure out how to pull the pieces of it that would make a difference and approach launching a new brand in a way that felt very thoughtful and holistic and single-minded. And um, at the time when we were building our business, I think in the industry, and especially for more established businesses that were engaging agencies, things were becoming more fragmented, more specialized, and the procurement process was like looking for people that were specialist agencies. And we were doing the opposite. Like we were off kind of in our corner building a holistic set of capabilities. We're under one roof. We have a digital team, an industrial design team, an advertising team, a content team, and obviously like a brand strategy and identity team. Because our, our perspective was that the more those things are working as one thing and you're thinking about brand as a customer experience, the easier it is to ensure that all those people, the, all those pieces click together and will show up in a way that feels single-minded. Like that was kind of, I think the objective from our perspective was if you're trying to launch a startup business, again, you've got one shot. You either are going to like get someone to understand what it is 
and be curious and want to lean in or not? And if the answer is not, you're probably going to fail. And so um, that was really what drove our approach and how we think about the work that we do. And ultimately, I think still to this day, is very different than how more traditional companies are thinking about process and engaging partners, um, where things are much more kind of like sliced and diced, and uh, and therefore you're trying to kind of like pull everything together and get it to feel holistic um, against kind of the, the inertia of how a process might be playing out. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a, a lot to sort of unpack there, and, and clearly uh, it's it's a very um, tailored model for, for these young young brands. Is, is there anything that perhaps some of the more traditional brand names uh, can take advantage of in, in terms of your techniques, um, or is it really just something that works you know, specifically for these types of companies? Absolutely. I think there are there's many things. Um, and we've been doing some more work with companies that are uh, established and have strong legacies and are thinking about innovation from a few perspectives. One is how do you take something that has a ton of heritage and equity and evolve it for this more digital age? Uh, and then also, how do you look at innovation in terms of building like net new things from the ground up, leveraging supply chain, um, R&D, IP, all of those things? I think it, it, those are similar but different challenges. Um, the conversations that I'm typically having with, with leaders of those businesses uh, and those brands is you have to think about creating the right context to drive success. So. Um, you know, if I think about how we've been able to be successful in working with companies like Casper, Allbirds, Brandless, Bowery, Pros, uh, a few things are at play. So one is like risk is inherent. So when you have a business that's at scale, the tendency is to protect and to think about change as something that is incremental and doesn't disrupt the state of the kind of the status quo. And, and that makes sense, that's a very kind of normal thing, but when you're thinking about more transformational change or doing something that's going to be disruptive and is the future of your business or your brand, you have to think about what the bolder moves are and what is the calculated risk that you can take that will set you up for a different future. And in working with startups, that is, that is, that's the name of the game, like risk is the thing. So I think that you can translate that to how can you define uh, you know, things you could create, changes you can make that will create a new, more of like a transformative step change in the business and feel confident enough that there's an opportunity, but you're never going to have enough data to know that it's going to work. And sort of that having confidence in that uncertainty is a very hard thing, but a very important thing. To be able to do that means that you've got the right stakeholders in the conversation and you've got buy-in from leadership that are going to be able to give the space to do things that might not work but if they do, could be incredibly powerful for a business. Um, I think another is understanding uh, who stakeholders are and how you define a process that can have momentum um, and, and move forward at a pace where you're creating things that are, are exciting and new and different. And when we've worked with more established businesses, something that we see as a really important dynamic is um, where many companies see research as a really important gating moment and decision criteria, we see research as potentially a liability. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be doing it, but I think you have to be really careful about why you're doing it and at what moments, and leverage research to inform, but not have research be the thing that is telling you which way to go. Because at the end of the day, um, many of the things that we have done in the work that we have created, well, first of all, none of it was tested. But if it was tested, it wouldn't have come out the way that it did. <laughs> because consumers are inherently are going to be drawn to something that feels familiar, that feels safe, and that likely won't cut through in the way that you need to. So I think that's a really critical one of, of kind of take a step back, look at your typical process, and, and have a critical eye to what's adding value to that process, and what are things that might be there because they had very good intention, but ultimately might not put you in a position to do what you need to do. Um, and, uh, and then I think the last is thinking about kind of incentive. Like how do you incentivize teams to want to take that risk, to want to break the rules, to want to think differently about how they're, because at the end of the day, I don't think that um, you know, having better designers is going to lead to a better outcome. I don't think that one idea is drastically better than another. At the end of the day, it's the context that you create that allows something incredible to happen. And so 
for companies that are more established and have more layers, more bureaucracy, more politics, more stakeholders, more established ways of working, I think the most critical thing is how can you pull those apart uh, and put things together in a way that will work within your organization, but also try new things. Great. Uh, we, we're getting a couple of questions in already, which is fantastic. We've got an active group today. Um, but just before we leave this topic, I just want to uh, flip that question that I asked you and, and ask you, is, is there something that uh, direct-to-consumer brands can learn from, from or these new sort of uh, startup brands can learn from the traditional brands? And perhaps it's something uh, that, that you know, you've brought to this area from your experience with Saatchi and, and working with some of the bigger names. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, focusing on why you're doing what you're doing and what problem you're solving for someone is so critical. And that's something that I think that established businesses inherently know and startups very easily miss. Um, I think startup teams and founders tend to be very focused on like what they are making. Like the product, the thing is everything, but what they miss is that's not why someone's gonna care about it. And, or that's not what's gonna make them feel connected to their brand. Um, I think that's the biggest thing that that companies that we I've worked with in the past and that we work with today um, we don't have to educate people on that like they they get it like the businesses that are that are established and at scale whether it's large CPG businesses retail businesses like that is an inherent that is an, as a fact I think in the world of startups that's something that requires education uh, and we I mean we're still constantly talking about that every day with our clients and companies that we potentially are going to be partnering with um, and I think another is being really smart about media. Uh, and we've seen a number of startups, you know, there's, there's a lot of benefit to being cavalier and having kind of the cowboy approach to just like figuring stuff out as you go. And uh, I think there are many things that startups do themselves and figure out the hard way and there can be a lot of benefit to that. But there can be a lot of mistakes too. For example, like buying media at like the, the rack rate versus understanding that if you kind of have the right conversations, go through the right channels. There are like different prices that different people are paying. I've seen startups go out and spend a whole bunch of money and like not even know that that's a thing. And that's something that obviously businesses that are negotiating things at a different scale understand inherently. Yeah, great. And and we'll we'll talk a little bit about media um, in in just a little while. But I want to uh, cover a couple of these yeah. questions here. I'm gonna since we're we've landed on the Casper uh, image here, I'm gonna pick up this question about Casper. Were you involved in, in choosing the name Casper, and, and what if, if so, what was the sort of um, idea behind it? What does it connote? Um, and FYI, he says it reminds us boomers of the cartoon goes from the fifties. Yeah. yeah, well, that was one of the that was one of the watchouts that we were discussing with their team. Um, so it was a name that was generated by the founders of Casper. So we didn't come up with the name, but out of the options they were choosing, it was one that we really strongly recommended, and I think. Why we liked it was that it was unexpected, very out of category, memorable, and um, well, kind of a you know a bit of a weird. If you think of Casper not as Casper the mattress brand, it's a bit of a weird name, um, and but it also sounds like a whisper. Like there's kind of a nice, it has a nice sound to it, like Casper whisper. Like it feels soft, um, and the discussion was definitely had about Casper the ghost, but he was a friendly ghost. So we felt that was a good thing, right. if anything, and yep. the younger generations have definitely have less of that uh, association. And I think that what we've found through the years is that with names, at the end of the day, the name is a vessel, and the challenge becomes how do you build meaning into it? And Casper is a great example where what you would have thought of Casper as a word and a name before that brand launched is very different than what you'd think today. And we've seen this countless times with different businesses we've worked with where in isolation, it's very hard to get excited about a name or to see how it could work. Allbirds is another one. Um, you know, multiple of the investors in that business before they launched, when they heard that that was the name, they were like, "What? <laughs> what is this weird name?" And um, but we were incredibly excited about it, and I think that we saw in it something that, again, felt unexpected, felt out of category, and there was a story behind it that consumers were probably not going to ever know. But there was a thoughtfulness and a purpose that made it feel true to the brand and the business. Um, and that story, which you're probably wondering. Um, so when we were thinking mm -hmm. about uh, thinking about that business, um, my two co-founders were having a conversation, and uh, Emily, who was leading the naming process, 
was thinking about um, you know sustainability, which is core to their business and their values. Uh, thinking about New Zealand, one of the co-founders was from New Zealand. Their wool is from New Zealand. There's very kind of like a rich New Zealand story. And she asked the question of you know what are some other birds from New Zealand other than the kiwi? And the response was, well before settlers, before humans arrived, New Zealand was all birds. And this idea of like an island just filled with birds. Apparently there were, I might be getting my facts slightly wrong, but I believe there were like no mammals or like barely any and some reptiles, but it was just like this island with tons and tons of birds. And there were kind of two meanings to that that we thought were really amazing. One was like the environmental impact of humans showing up. So like there's that. But the other is this idea of birds, flight, travel, exploration, and this kind of inherent community notion built into it of like we are all birds. And uh, so for us, we thought it was incredibly exciting, though like weird, until you could turn it into something that the people could wrap their heads around and feel and look and see and connect to a product. Um, but yeah, I think that we, we have a lot of fun, although it's the hardest thing that we do, naming businesses, um, trying to find something that isn't playing into trends, but instead hopefully kind of creating them. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And uh, and the founder was a was a soccer player too, if I yep, remember. Yep, he played professional he? soccer. He was on the New Zealand national team, football as they would call it. Um, so very <laughs> very uh, engaged in the footwear space, um, and really passionate about sustainability. And it kind of came together in what is a, a really interesting, smart, incredible business. Um, and so Tim was the soccer player, and Joey, his other co-founder. A really incredible partnership of passion around the product and the mission and experience and thinking about sustainable supply chains and I think they've built something absolutely incredible. Yeah, and I won't hold it against him that he played for the New Zealand national team, <laughs> being from uh, the neighboring yeah, yeah. country. Um, great. So don't don't be the the, we'll, the mean uh, big brother neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, hey, hey, <laughs> no pressure. Um, so we've got another question here. This kind of feels like a bit of a uh, conclusion cr question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it came in first, and I think it's a good one. Uh, what What's the hope or your advice for seasoned marketers in their 50s who were successful in the traditional marketing and brand building approaches, uh, i.e. non-digital? Yes. I love that question. I think it cuts to the core of one of the really key challenges in marketing today and something that we see consistently um, with every business that we work with, especially and specifically startups, there is a there is a tension between what I think is seen as kind of like traditional marketing, right? Brand marketing, more thematic, strategic, narrative, uh, becoming more trackable, but you know, obviously different than um, acquisition, direct, digital performance marketing just to try to throw all of the adjectives in to make sure I, co I collect it all in two buckets. And um, what we're seeing is that companies are struggling to figure out which one of those is the driver of, like kind of the leader of success, right? Like do you have a leader within your organization that understands brand marketing or do you have a leader that understands performance marketing? Um, because I think we used to live in a world where you had a CMO, you had a you know, brand manager, VP marketing, whatever the title might be, and that person inherently was a brand marketer. And ROI and performance were inherent in the success of a business, but it meant a very different thing before all this access that we have to data um, analytics and everything from just like real time, um, you know, bidding. Like, there's so many things that have shifted, but at the end of the day, these businesses are still building brands and they have to be thinking thematically and they need to be focused on the big picture. And if you lose that, connection to storytelling and and even down to the details of just like the aesthetic of how you show up, I think that's an incredibly dangerous thing. So finding how, figuring out how to strike that balance at the company and brand level is a real struggle right now. And I was sitting with the founder of, of one of the really successful businesses we've worked with and we were having this conversation and they're looking for a new marketing leader and it's just, just it's a debate of like, okay, do you hire someone that really understands performance and then get someone working underneath them that kind of understands brand or do you hire someone that understands brands and working performance? And like the answer isn't either of those. I, like, I don't think there is one answer, but I would say that there is even more of a need for people that have the experience and the perspective um, of you know, how to think about building, maintaining, evolving, growing a brand. And 
the power of data and analytics and digital is there as a tool and needs to be helping to inform and grow. But I feel like we need more of that perspective than ever before. Otherwise, things are going down a path of like A-B testing to success, which ultimately can very easily undermine um, the quality of the content you're producing, the experience that you create. Like we, we, we see this frequently where companies that are very, very much data-driven, that have engineering founders and teams that are focused on the numbers, they don't even they can't even see what their brand looks like and how they show up. And if you're a consumer and you're getting targeted with ads, the quality of those assets, you know, I, I'm kind of a obsessive detail person, so I'm just looking at like, oh, like that image is blurry and the fonts are not aligned and like things are not scaled in a way that makes sense. Every little interaction is a brand moment. And I think that we're working towards a place where these things are going to come together and there's going to be sense made of how that they can work as one where the digital and performance side of it uh, informs how we think about brands but everything becomes a brand moment so I don't think this is a moment where it's like the digital analytics side is becoming the supreme and all of that great seasoned marketer experience is becoming irrelevant at all because I don't think the people who have grown up in this new world understand the other side of it and we're seeing more and more of these new businesses that are going into traditional media channels, they're opening retail stores, they're doing wholesale partnerships, they're running TV spots, like all of this stuff that is like more traditional. And I think that what old is, it, what's old is becoming new again and it all needs to kind of merge together. So I think that that is not one concise answer, but I think there's a thematic shift happening that's going to require a lot of different perspectives coming together. Great. Right. Uh, ho hopefully uh, that that helps answer your question there. Uh, we've got one more um, in the in the um, hopper here. One of the challenges I face uh, is the brand I work with is really thin, not a lot of information. It's basically a logo, colors, and fonts. It has a thin value proposition. Uh, it's strictly a B two B brand, but the leadership wants us to build awareness and loyalty, etc. Uh, like a retail brand, how can we build equity with the end user? when it isn't well understood by leadership, but it is also something I expect. Top it is. We have seen this challenge many mm -hmm. times, so not an uncommon one. Um, I think that you know something I talk about very tactically is when you're trying to sell, uh, well, you know, if I make the assumption that it's a, a software product, which maybe it isn't, but a lot of times in B2B in general, you don't have the shiny, glossy objects of the thing you're trying to sell because what you're selling is either a service or a more technical product and you know screenshots of things are not the most compelling assets to leverage so I think what you have to do is figure out what are the stories you can tell that exist around your product um, and get to you know sort of for me it always comes back to like why is someone gonna care what impact can you have what change can you create so if you think about from your customers perspective why should they choose you over someone else? What what impact can you have on their business, on their career, even for them as sort of a leader of that company? And um, and figure out how to extrapolate that to something that is going to be more unexpected and more interesting. And I think that a way that a business that's in that position that doesn't have a really rich brand system, that doesn't have a, a bunch of assets that they can leverage, um, we tend to find that trying to convince leadership that like changing the brand is the answer is a very hard thing to do. Um, sometimes it can be done, but it's difficult. And if you don't have the buy-in, it's going to be a challenging process. Instead, what you could do is think more about what assets you can create that create examples of where things could go. So think about um, video, I think, is one really powerful way to take something that might be more abstract but tell stories through customer experience. Uh, tell stories through kind of the impact the product can have through statistics, through data, through performance, um, and use that as a creative opportunity to sort of like, if, kind of like a backdoor evolve the visual system and the narrative and the messaging. If you find the right partner to do it, you can kind of use that as a way to educate your team and your leadership and show them what they could have. And I think that's probably the most powerful way to spark change. Um, where ultimately you probably need to also evolve a marketing site and the sales funnel and all the things that are a part of the brand and the customer experience, but that wholesale change can be really tough. Great. Okay. Um, 
So I want to I want to challenge you just a little bit here, JB, because as we sort of scroll through some of these uh, brands and and um, and uh, packagings and and the way they look and things like that, we start to see that you know a lot of these kind of are, are quite similar. Um, the brand names sound a little bit alike. They're sort of one name, snappy, often with lowercase uh, font here. Uh, at the same time, the packaging is starting to be pretty pretty similar. A lot of them have this apothecary sort of style to them. Is you know, is this approach to branding is it just a fad, or is it, do you think it's something that is going to be sticking around for a while? Yep, I think that uh, I mean trends are not new. I think we we exist in a world of trends across everything, and uh, in the world of design, there are very few truly original things. Everything is kind of an evolution, an adaptation of something else. And so I think when when people like look at design from a zoomed out perspective, it's very easy to think that f things feel similar. The way that we think about it and the way that we approach it is trying very much to not be following trends, but trying to do the things that aren't being done and pushing away. And I think in an era where um, there's lots of like friendly one word names that sound familiar or like post Warby Parker, Warby Parker. There are a lot of like put two things together and that's the name of your business. Um, we've been trying to do things that I think are more unexpected, more interesting, different. Um, and visually, similarly, I think we're at a moment now where if you think about it, there was this like, kind of a direct to consumer startup thing that happened that has grown and grown and grown and there's more brands launching than ever before. It's easier to launch a brand, it's easier to get access to capital, it's easier to create a product and define a co-packer and you know put up an e-com site and all those things. And if you add on top of that, traditional businesses are now fully on board with the fact that they need to be playing that game as well. So when you have um, you know Procter & Gamble launching a razor brand through Walmart and you have ShopRite launching Paperbird that looks like a startup brand for paper goods like now you have the big established businesses coming into like the startup neighborhood of look and feel so it's even more crowded so it's like if you're a startup and then you've got traditional businesses looking like startups to me like that game's over so I think that where opportunity sits is something totally different and you need to be carving out new territory and not looking at trends and not shooting products silhouetted with like high flash and not using millennial pink, like all of those things in my mind um, are things that are going to kind of make you be lost in the sea of stuff that's already happening. And so I think there absolutely are trends and I think there's, uh, you know, there's a difference between as a brand trying to chart your own path and do something that's unique to you and, uh, and you know, I don't think it's about creating trends, but sort of just charting your own territory and then doing things that feel uh, familiar, but ultimately are derivative of other things that are already happening. And um, I think there are many startup businesses that if they don't have the kind of brand leadership and creative leadership within their team, uh, don't have the kind of like the confidence to take that risk to do something that doesn't look like anything else. So what they wind up doing is something that looks familiar, it looks like another brand that they admire, that consumers like, because that feels like a, a safer solution. So I think that um, you know this is a moment where doing things that are new and different is more important than ever because tied to that is also the fact that like we've we're talking about millennials for a long time. Millennials are getting older and like it's actually about Gen Z. And that's a different generation with a different set of priorities and values and um, and I think they really embrace things that are messier and more real and raw and they want transparency in like a different way than millennial millennials expected transparency in terms of like um information and like kind of being informed and understanding your values i think gen z expect it in uh at a whole other level and to me that's incredibly exciting because what it means for we do, what we do as a business and for how brands have to behave it's it's like a, it's a new world. So I think that if you're an established business looking at what does success look like today, how do we make sure that we're going to be successful, and all you're doing is chasing what startups are doing, you're five years, ten years behind. And instead, it needs to be how do we be a part of where things are going, which is kind of like yet to be charted. Okay. Yeah. You you're touching on some of my follow up questions here, but I, I was going to ask you sort of what's around the corner. Um, I think you. You answered that with with the Gen Z comment about what they expect um, 
things are things are sort of messier, uh, radically transparent. Is is there anything else that you sort of see around the corner? Is it just it, is it difficult to to predict that? Oh, it's fun to take a guess, right? Uh, I think yeah. um, something else that we've seen just kind of like ramping over the years is the amount of content that businesses have to create and brands have to create. Um, I like the reference point of like when we worked with Casper, this is early 2014 when they launched, uh, we probably had like 12 really well-produced lifestyle photographs um, and some product photography. And that was enough to launch that brand and be off to incredible momentum. And today, a similar type of launch, we're probably producing um, 15 to 30 uh, short video cuts for Instagram and Facebook to be used in performance marketing on own channels, probably 80 to 100 images, like, and that's just to kind of get started as a business. So the amount of content that businesses need has only been increasing, and I think the variety of that content is only going to increase as well. So how do you think about the ways that you, that you show up and what types of content you're creating because we're in a very different moment than, you know, when I started in advertising, we would spend like all year to shoot like two 30 second spots with some 15 second cut downs. And like that was the content that was produced and like maybe there was one photo shoot. Fast forwarding to today, things have such a shorter shelf life and the moments when you can really be that highly produced and strategic are like much fewer, it doesn't mean that that approach doesn't still have relevance, but you have to think about how that translates into like so many other little pieces of things that can exist in different places. How does your community fuel the stories you're telling and how you show up? Um, just how do you like expose more of the behind the scenes of how you do what you do? All of that stuff is so much more fluid and um, that creates just like even more complexity. So I think that where things are going next is that uh, rules are going to play a different role. And I think that kind of thinking about brands in terms of systems and guidelines, you'll need even tighter systems and guidelines, but not to therefore make things prescriptive, but instead to really know who you are and how you should behave so that you can then have that much more freedom in how you express it. And I think that's a thing that's, that's happening and, and we're thinking a lot about um, what our point of view is on that and how we want to help the businesses that we work with show up. Um, I think it creates a very exciting for future for brands, but it's also a very uncertain one because that is a, that's a complicated, uh, a complicated thing to actually like operationalize and manage. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and just one other point I want to, I want to touch on that you made before about uh, some of the bigger, bigger brands uh, introducing startup look and feel type, type products. There's another question I had down the list here um, about how, how these startup brands prevent themselves from essentially being pushed aside by the bigger brands that might, uh, might be copying them or commoditizing their, their sort of uh, their, their world, if you will. I think I think your answer is going to be, um, you know, it, it needs to be new and and different. But is is there anything else that these startups can do to prevent, um, you know, being pushed aside by the bigger brands introducing and and moving into their world? Yeah. What? So the the strengths that startups have, or kind of the assets at their disposal, are being able to be nimble, being able to take risk. Um, I think that something I think a lot about is inherent to a startup is a story, there's a founding story, there's a mission story, there's often a founder, like there's literally like the people that started that company. Mm -hmm. And there are sort of like levers that a startup can pull that for established brands are, are harder. And um, I think that the smart startups are experimenting, trying things across different channels, doing pop-up retail. They're doing those things quickly to learn what works for their business. And you know, we we don't live in a, it's not a zero sum game. And I think that there's opportunity to like grow categories even further by having new startups and established brands. Um, I think we'll start seeing a lot more consolidation, acquisition, and these startup brands becoming part of bigger brand business portfolios um, at a faster clip. And some of those will be great success stories. Others might be business got stuck and then becomes part of something, but then gets power to grow even even further, I think it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of things that play out. 
Um, but I think that you know what's interesting is uh, sort of scale and legacy used to be a determinant of success, and I think we're living in a moment right now in the markets and in business and with consumers where legacy has more become a liability. Because I think what legacy does is it gives you uh, false confidence. Um, it makes you feel like, you know, it's kind of like the too big to fail mentality. It sort of deters you from taking risk. And I think um, you can absolutely launch new things, and it's been done a few times really well by big businesses, but that's a new muscle to figure out. And I think we're, we're seeing a lot of companies really wrestle with how do they do that? Is it a team that is in a different office that has different org structure, different incentive models, different capital sources, or is it part of the core business but set up in a different, like, there's a lot of really interesting questions to answer to figure out how to set those things up where they truly can um, live and breathe and be successful. Uh, but I think the good news for the established businesses is that, you know, if you're a consumer product business, the retailers, like, are going to want to partner with you. I've been in those meetings. Like, they want to help bring new things to market for the businesses that they've been partners with for years because there is that relationship. There's a level of trust and authority, and that's a really powerful thing. They also want to have those conversations with the startup brands because it's new and it's shiny and it's a story they can tell to get consumers in the door. So I think that, like, everyone within that spectrum has a great chance to win, and it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. And, and we're excited to partner with businesses across that spectrum as well. And we're doing work with a founder who has an idea and hasn't raised any money, and we're doing work with Fortune 100 companies that are thinking about what's next and looking for a partner that can kind of think holistically about creating customer experiences. In each category, it's a different game, and some distribution is the thing that helps you win. In others, it's telling new stories and, and innovating on technology and how you deliver a product and create content. And so we're sort of very nimble in how we approach it because I don't believe that there's one way to play the game or that there's kind of like only going to be one set of winners at the end of the day. Uh, we've got a, another question here from a viewer here, another good one. The startup uh, our agency works with uses a lot of vocabulary specific to their niche, a lot of uh, times created around the product. What's the best way to educate the public on the vocabulary so it doesn't have to be defined in every post or every release? Or every release yeah, I mean, a lot of what we do is trying to break things down into language that people actually understand. And I think that's relevant for consumer businesses. It's especially relevant for enterprise businesses. Um, and that, to me, goes to the point where like startups are so focused on their product and why the thing they're creating is unique and special that they often miss the part of, like, why does anyone care? And so when I hear something like that, what it makes me think about is things need to be kind of like leveled up, broken apart, and turned into a set of language and tools that can communicate in a way that people just inherently get instead of talking about the thing that it is in a way that's bespoke to that. Because I think that you know we've, we've been in the game of bringing new things to market for 12 and a half years, and education, is, is, that's, that's what it is, right? Like we're constantly trying to help people understand new categories, new products and services, new ways of thinking, new ways of, of transacting. And to be able to do that, you have to figure out how to find a balance between uh, the familiar and the, the new and the unknown. And I think that if something doesn't have those cues of feeling familiar, it's really hard for people to want to feel a part of it. And you have to find out how you strike that balance and the way that you communicate that, like, yes, this feels new and different, but it's also something that I get and it feels comfortable to me. That's a thing that's really hard to strike, and I think that startups really struggle to do it for themselves. So you've got to figure out how to help them get there, um, which makes everything else way easier. Great. And uh, time, time is flying by. I just want to point out to everyone, uh, if, if you have any questions that you've been holding on to, please feel free to, feel free to put them in now. Uh, we're going to find the last 10 minutes fly by, I think, and I have a laundry list of things that we won't even get to, but uh, let's, let's carry on. Um, so we were talking a little bit about media before, and I want to carry on that conversation. Uh, a lot of a lot of these startup brands are starting, as you mentioned, to graduate beyond their digital roots uh, into the traditional television market. I think this weekend will be a, a great indicator with the Super Bowl coming up. 
Last year, there were a couple of brands up there. I think Bubbly was one. Um, and then I, I was reading before a new report uh, on US ad spending last year found direct-to-consumer marketers increased their ad spend 32% in the first half of uh, 2019, but their national TV ad spent 52.9% um, on top of a 35% increase the prior year. So um, are we seeing some boundaries in online advertising that these companies, these startups are starting to hit up against uh, as they sort of realize they, they might want to graduate into the traditional TV market? Yeah, I think there's a few trends at play. So one is that you can't build a business on Facebook and Instagram alone anymore, or like call it Facebook, Instagram search. Um, those channels are still incredibly powerful and everyone is still using them and testing them and finding ways to make them work for the business. Um, so I think there there's a, a search for what the other channels are that businesses can leverage and some are looking at, at retail and brick and mortar as a marketing channel where there could potentially be a lower cost of acquisition than spending in digital. Um, I also think that uh, you can now buy TV in a way that is far more bite-sized, far more um, trackable to understand how it performs. So startups are able to kind of wrap their heads around how it relates to the way they think about marketing. And they can do it in, uh, you know, we've had businesses that have raised, one in particular I think had raised maybe like five, six million dollars in total, and they were testing TV. And, you know, a couple of years ago, like that never would have happened. But now you can say like, hey, we want to do like a $200,000 test with some direct response um, TV spots and run them in like whether it's OTT channels or on actual kind of broadcast. And you can run those assets see how it performs and like decide if you want to do more of it. So I think startups feel comfortable experimenting in those channels. And then there's the, the kind of obvious layer of it, which coming from more traditional advertising and from more traditional brands that, um, you know, I think there's still kind of nothing that has the reach of TV and it's also an incredible legitimizer. So if you're a new business and you can show up through a channel that gives you credibility, that's a really powerful thing. And so I think you see more brands are getting that, and that's happening whether it's with uh, TV spend or also out of home. Um, that's another channel that I think is just one that kind of can provide ROI, but also credibility for these new businesses. Um, then I think another variable that's at play, which is just a you know it's sort of a it's a shift in what's happening in the market, is that. Um, it used to be that startups were full of like startup people, young talent, many people that had like never worked in more traditional brand marketing, advertising environments. And we're seeing more and more that a company that's early stage has a marketer at the table that's been at a big business and knows how to think about those more traditional media channels. And so that kind of goes back to the question of how does someone who's a seasoned, more traditional marketer think about what's next? Startups need that perspective, and so we're seeing startups have people who are either consulting or a part of their team much earlier in their life cycle so that they can have confidence to understand what to do with those channels. There's also now more bespoke media solutions that are speaking to startups and direct consumer businesses to make uh, those channels understandable, again, bite size, uh, ROI driven. So to me, that's a trend that is only going to grow and, uh, and and alongside that there's I think there's going to continue to be a shift of like trying new channels and thinking about like where are other businesses not showing up because there's so many companies in every category that um, you know having a novel idea is not going to move the needle um, having a cool brand is like you know a necessary piece of the puzzle but not the determinant of success and if you're showing up on all the same channels as your competitors you have to be the one who's shouting the loudest, spending the most money. And so I think a more interesting way to play the game is like what channels are other people not showing up on and what can you uniquely do in those channels to start a conversation that will help power your business. And you know, that could be, you know, how do you think about like Pinterest as a channel that can drive success? Or how do you think about more offline activations and partnerships? And so I think we're gonna see kind of like a return to more creative media channels and creative ideas and things that look like stuff that was happening maybe like 10, 20 years ago, but through a new lens because it can't just be that everyone's trying to buy Facebook and Google ads. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. 
Okay, I think uh, we'll start to wind this down, JB. I want to I want to give you a chance to reflect a little bit. Um, who inspires you, or what inspires you? Which which brand builders out there do you do you take inspiration from? Yeah, I mean something. What I probably spend my the most time thinking about is the companies that we work with that take things that we do and make them better, right? So I think in my mind, then brand building today happens in practice, and um, I think oftentimes, at least the historical perspective, is that you find some expert, you hire them, and they create something, and it's this amazing, iconic thing. I was thinking the other day of like the really classic example of the uh, the New York City subway, like the MTA brand system, which was done by, uh, I think it was Massimo Vignelli. It's like this just beautiful, like iconic design system. And like that was a way that brand was thought about at a moment in time. And I think things are in such a different place now. And the work that someone like us does is important, it's foundational, it's grounding, but it's like, it's really kind of a, it's a piece of a much bigger, more complicated puzzle. So I really, I admire the teams who are out there and creating things that continue to evolve and grow and become even more powerful and meaningful. Uh, and it's companies that we've worked with and companies that we haven't. So, um, you know, a, a business that I think is incredible that uh, are people that we know and never worked with would be Warby Parker. Um, I just have a ton of respect for what they've created and the amount of care and attention they've put into every detail of execution. And I think it's kind of hard to point to a business that's opened as many retail locations as they have, where each one is specific and unique and feels thoughtful. And if you walked into it, the details are on point. Like that is incredible. And I think um, a really great example of how businesses have to behave today. Um, and uh, yeah, Glossier is another business that I think has just done an incredible job of powering a business through community and creating this kind of cultural movement that uh, you kind of look at it from the outside and it's like, wow, like that's a hard thing to make and they continue to kind of build and build and build and come out with new things and evolve. Uh, so I have a ton of respect uh, for that as well. Um, and, and, you know, so the new thing that I'm kind of, I have my eyes on, and I think I like, it's yet to be seen what the answer is, is what I'm looking for is the people that are going to inspire change within the more traditional um, kind of lar large private and public company environment that are putting new things out there that disrupt their own businesses and really set shining examples. And I think that's just around the corner. And so I don't know what the, I don't, I don't know who those are yet, but I'm like sitting and, and waiting patiently, patiently and excitedly to see, uh, to see what plays out. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I, and me too. I'll be, I'll be watching with interest. Um, you, you're just touching on the Warby Parker and the retail locations there. I'm so I, I could go another hour with you here, JB. I, I wanted to, to talk about the retail and, and how important it was, but I'm afraid uh, time has gotten ahead of us here. So, um, at this stage, I think I'll just uh, say thank you very much to you, JB, for, for joining us and thank you to everyone for tuning in today. Um, I'd like to draw your attention, uh, those watching, to the final slide here. Uh, this is a new tool from the conference board. It's our Human Capital Benchmarking Service, uh, which, is, which assesses competitive metrics and practices against your most valuable asset. That's your people. As you see here, there are 10 uh, functional surveys to take part in. If you're among the first 200 respondents to complete your topical survey, uh, the conference board will award you with a free pass uh, to your choice of upcoming US conferences, and that's worth $2,895 in value. So just go ahead and visit conferenceboard.org slash human capital benchmarks uh, to take your survey there. Uh, I also want to tell you to keep an eye out for the February Marketing Communications Center watch as well, which will be coming out, coming out soon. We don't quite yet have a date secured for that, but uh, keep an eye on our website for, for when that uh, is released and uh, get registered for that. And then also, of course, we have a, a ton of related resources from the conference board. You can see here a couple of publications and, and other webcasts, but there's plenty more on our website. Uh, if I could remind you all, please, to fill out the feedback form that you'll see when uh, this webcast closes. That'll help us uh, finesse our future programming. But for now, again, Thank you so much for joining us, JB. Uh, thanks for everyone for watching. This has been a Marketing Communications Watch webcast from the Conference Board, and we hope to see you all again soon.